UK Cambridge Centre podcast. In this Integrated Cancer Medicine Research and Focus series, I talk to various ICM members about their research and how it is supported by the vision of the Mark Foundation Institute for Integrated Cancer Medicine. MFICM research uses cutting-edge analytics to maximise the use of diverse high-volume data sets and by capturing cancer heterogeneity in time and space in patients receiving active treatment. Integrated Cancer Medicine aims to transform the way the world treats cancer by affecting patients along their treatment pathway and ultimately accelerate cures. Today I have with me Ben Newton, Professors Avis Sala and James Brenton and Dr Maria Crispin Ortuza to talk about the new research collaboration between GE Healthcare, the University of Cambridge and Addenbrooke's Hospital. Ben Newton is Global Head of Oncology Solutions at GE Healthcare. Professor Avis Sala is Professor of Oncological Imaging, co-leader of the Advanced Cancer Imaging Programme and co-leader of the Integrated Cancer Medicine Programme at the University of Cambridge. Professor James Brenton is Professor of Ovarian Cancer Medicine and Academic Honorary Consultant in Medical Oncology, as well as co-leader of the Integrated Cancer Medicine Programme at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Maria Crispin Ortuza is University Lecturer in Integrated Cancer Medicine at the University of Cambridge. To start with, Evis, can you tell us how this collaboration started? Well, Ellie, this is a very good question, and uh, I cannot really pinpoint the date because we've had such a long-standing collaboration with GE, um, and, and obviously this has started over the years with being purely an imaging collaboration and focused on MRI initially. As we grew and as we all worked together around the integrated cancer medicine, obviously there were common interests uh, between us and GE, and I think probably it was a presentation that they gave in one of our sort of combined meetings you know, there were really so much enthusiasm from both sides to actually go forward. So it was an organical sort of brought together. Well, I also believe that we're very good at, uh, at advancing things and inventing things. But then when it comes to actually getting them to patients, we really need industry. So I think it's been quite a blessing as a collaboration. Thanks. And Ben, can you tell me what attracted you to Cambridge as a collaborator? What, what attracted us actually was... I think at that meeting that, that Evis referred to, we talked about our strategic priorities. We talked about integrated care, and I think Cambridge, James and Evis and, and, and Richard shared their vision for integrated uh, cancer care, and we shared our vision for integrated cancer care, and they were identical. I mean, essentially identical. The shared vision around having visibility to each patient's data, whether they're in a silo in a, in a hospital around imaging or, or genomics or indeed pathology, or of course in the medical records, we had this shared vision that actually we needed to bring those data sets together so that each physician referring or treating physician would have up-to-date visibility so they could make shared decisions around what's best for the patient. And building on that, that actually this could become interactive, could be a research platform, it could become an AI development platform, it could be a clinical decision support tool, platform or repository, you name it. I think from each of the areas that I've described and the fact that it needed to be contained in this integrated system, we agreed upon. And, you know, you couple that in all honesty with the world-class capabilities at Cambridge and indeed the just the most outstanding reputations, of course, from a clinical care perspective already at Cambridge. There's nothing that we don't like about this. That There was everything really attracted us to working at, at Cambridge. So that's really, in a nutshell, what, uh, what happened. That's great. So you've already told me a little bit about the development of this application and, and what it's going to be. Do you want to just tell me a little bit more detail exactly what we're developing together? Absolutely. And perhaps what I should do is I'll leave it to James and Evis as the clinicians, because they've really driven the clinical utility in terms of the challenges that exist in clinical care today, particularly in the UK, but also globally. But essentially, the application that we're developing is a longitudinal shared patient record. Data in hospitals is in all sorts of locations. And traditionally, those data have been brought together, not only in the heads of the 
caregivers and the physicians, but in forum like the multidisciplinary team meeting or tumor board environment, those interactions, those meetings can be somewhat chaotic. It can be somewhat of a bottleneck. And so what we wanted to try to do was to develop a system that could bring decision-making up to date, to bring data together. So rather than bringing people together in a room, bring the data together in a shared record that could be visible, that could have high fidelity with respect to the situation, and decisions could be made very quickly relative to the referral and, and the treatment. So that, of course, the right treatment, the right quality treatment, as well as the most precise treatments or combinations of therapies could be applied. So it's really that shared patient record, 360 degree view of each patient that we want to create. But maybe it's a good point to, to bring in James and Evis to talk a little bit about the specific needs from a clinical standpoint. Sure. Actually, my next question was to James, and I was just going to ask him to outline the need for this application. And if you could just tell us who, who will use it and why you think it's game changing. Thank you. I think there are very important needs for this approach. So the first thing to say is that if we look at women with ovarian cancer, the vast majority present unfortunately with advanced disease with multiple sites of cancer throughout the abdomen. And we know that those different sites of disease, those different metastatic areas have important differences. So they're genomically different. That's the wiring diagram of the DNA structure inside the cancer cells. And their tumor microenvironment is also different. Now the tumor microenvironment is the composition of immune cells and normal fibroblast kind of stromal cells. And these differences both in the wiring diagram and in the cellular composition make a difference in terms of treatment and may tell us important things about how to choose treatment for a patient. And because most ladies now have chemotherapy before surgery, we need new ways of using imaging to glean information about those differences. So that's one of the really important needs. The second really important need is we're dealing with lots of information in our multidisciplinary team meetings and bringing in this sort of complexity needs a new way of working and it needs to be accessible to myself and my clinical colleagues and we need to be able to rapidly understand what's going on with the patient but also bring in state-of-the-art information simultaneously in that process. So I think it's going to be game-changing because at the moment MDTs are a bit of a struggle even with the information we have, if we leave out all this fancy new information, it's hard to bring it all together. It's hard to stay on top of it, particularly when patients have complex changes as to how they're responding to treatment or something else happens. So being able to encapsulate that in rapidly accessible graphical summaries, looking at the longitudinal pathway for a patient very quickly, and importantly, getting everyone up to speed at the same time, is completely game-changing for the way that we look after patients. Thanks, James. Evis, do you have anything to add? And perhaps you could tell us why you decided to use ovarian cancer as a proof of concept as well. So I can echo James's thoughts that it's absolutely crucial that we integrate the data for the best care. And then what we learn and what we develop in Cambridge, then we sort of take it out to our regional sites. So in a way, the, the best care it's then given to patients equally throughout the region. They don't really have to be in Cambridge as such. And I think this is, this is really important. Why do we choose ovarian cancer? Well, the first reason is, or maybe there are equal reasons, but uh, the first to mention is that uh, it is quite a devastating disease. Although it's a rare disease in terms of numbers, uh, it's got quite a high mortality, and uh, which hasn't changed over the, over the years. And urgent, better ways are needed to assess treatment response, and then better ways to charge patients to clinical trials, because what we have now, obviously, is not fit for purpose. The second is the expertise in Cambridge, such as the, the lot of expertise in ovarian cancer, both from the genomic side, clinical side with James, as well as from the imaging side with myself and my group, and obviously Maria from the computational side. And then the third is that uh, for ovarian cancer, we have, we have the multidisciplinary team or, or the US terms of the tumor board meetings where we discuss every single patient in the region. And that does not happen almost for, for most of the tumors, but not for everyone. So I think it, it is a way getting back to distributing care back to the, to the community is a way to actually have a higher impact than just if you choose something that it will be only applied to other groups. 
Thanks, Lewis. Maria, can I bring you into the discussion? Can you tell us which other disease areas you'll be able to include post the proof of concept stage? Yeah, thanks, Ellie. That's a, a great question. We're very lucky that this collaboration builds on the experience and expertise of the Integrated Cancer Medicine Programme in Cambridge, which actually includes multiple teams, the ovarian team, of course, but also the renal cancer team, the breast cancer team, pancreatic, hematological malignancies, and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. And we all share this vision of using data integration to improve our understanding of the disease and of course also the care that is given to patients. So the vision that we're developing in this collaboration ultimately will be applied to all of these diseases. I wanted to highlight renal cancer because I think it's probably the most immediate continuation of the work that we're doing because there are many things that are shared between ovarian cancer and renal cancer in terms of the data modalities that we have, the genomics, the imaging are very similar, uh, but also some of the complexities, for example, both ovarian and, and renal cancer are very heterogeneous. If you look at the disease, if you look at a single tumor, you can actually find that there are distinct molecular profiles that you can find. So if you look at uh, the information that you get from a biopsy, there's actually differences within a single lesion. And that's the kind of problem that you can really understand much better if you have uh, such a data integration system. So I, I expect renal cancer to be the next disease that we tackle. I would also highlight the fact that this is a, really a disease agnostic solution that we're building. So even though we're now naming some concrete diseases, the beauty of this is that we will be able to apply it to any other disease type in Adam Brooks and beyond, as Evis was saying. This goes well beyond a single healthcare institution. I think ultimately we would all like to see data integration as the way forward for cancer care. It's a really exciting prospect. And actually, my next question to Evis was going to be, can we widen this application to include other cancer types? Do you think that's a possibility to include all eventually? Yes, absolutely. This is actually the idea. We start in ovarian cancer. The other thing I forgot to mention earlier is that ovarian cancer is actually a good example of metastatic disease, all the unfortunate presentation for those patients, but a good model of metastatic disease. So it will be applicable to any tumor that metastasizes in the abdominal and thoracic cavity. So it will be applied to metastatic pancreas, bladder, stomach, breast, obviously. But the next one, it will be renal cancer, as Maria outlined, and then and breast cancer. And then hopefully, as we go from one type of tumor to the other, we will have learned. So our models will be much better. And then obviously, there will be a specific tumor type as well. But we'll have learned how to aggregate the data well, to, to do it quick, how to perfect our models, and really how to take those to the community back. So I think it's a win-win situation. Yeah, I can see that. Ben, can I ask you, could it potentially be used in the treatment of other diseases wider than just cancer? Absolutely. The way we are working with Cambridge is essentially in layers. The fundamental platform, if you like, is disease agnostic, as, as James and, and Evis have alluded to. When you think about providing a shared patient record that will allow a longitudinal view on patients' data, and we talked about genomics and pathology as well as imaging and the medical records themselves. Actually, that's the enabling piece. And we picked, of course, ovarian cancer is if you like the first cancer to get started with. Maria's outlined renal, and of course, um, we're thinking of, of breast as well, and other cancers can follow. But the fundamental data sets involved in decision making in cancer are no different in other diseases um, from cardiovascular to neurological disorders as, as well. So I think the platform we will have, if you like, as a generic system where data can be pulled in, we'll functionalize it with respect to specific cancers, as you said, in this sort of stepwise approach. But that functionalization will allow tailoring to particular care pathways so that referring and treating physicians will have an environment that is familiar, that is useful, and of course, that is going to be directed towards the absolute clinical needs within that care pathway. But then the functionalization for other pathways in neurology and, and cardiology, of course, can follow because underpinning the need is this basic need to access data in these modalities, which of course are critical for, for all diseases. So that's really the, how we're thinking about scaling it over the, over the next few years. Thanks. 
And James, could I ask you to, to outline what types of data the platform, this particular platform in ovarian cancer will integrate? So this is going to bring in the data we know about already. So those are clinical features about a patient, their critical blood markers, potentially aspects of previous history, etc. But what it's going to bring in that's new is these new complex data sets. So instead of just looking at imaging, we'll look at characteristics of the imaging. These are so-called radiomic features. And we will also bring in additional information about the volume of disease. So by working with GE, by working with the work that Maria and Evis and others have been leading, we'll be able to bring tools that we've developed around machine learning to identify which are the areas of cancer, how much volume of cancer there is into this system. And then on top of that, we want to bring in the standard of care sequencing that's now being done for patients with ovarian and triple negative breast cancer. So that's whole genome sequencing data. So we will want to bring that in. And then there's going to be more exploratory or experimental information that may be relevant for research, not necessarily for decision making, but being able to bring it together so we can learn things that when tested can feed into future treatment. So that would include single cell studies or molecular pathology for new markers, et cetera. So those, those in the short term don't change the treatment for a patient, but they build and allow us to build this very large information set about patients that will feed forward to new treatments. So it will, in effect, have the capacity to integrate further data streams as they show themselves to be relevant to the treatment of certain types of cancers. Absolutely. Maria, can I ask, does it have the capacity to integrate AI components that are being developed in the research setting currently? I know that that's one area of your research in particular. Yes, uh, that's absolutely right. And in fact, it's probably one of the most exciting aspects of, of this tool. It's not just data aggregation, it's also integration, and it also solves some pain point along the clinical pathway. So in fact, I think I would I would probably classify these you know, AI solutions that you were referring to into three different categories broadly. So we have the standard, let's say off the shelf AI solutions that solve some important problems, for example, based on natural language processing and OP, such that you can take unstructured text and extract the bits of information that are key and that is, I guess I wouldn't call it necessarily a research solution, but it is an AI-based tool that we expect the platform to have. We also have the more tailored AI solutions that are still solving you know, important aspects of the clinical pathway and that have been developed specifically for that purpose. And I'm thinking, for example, of things like segmentation algorithms. And what I mean by segmentation algorithms in this context is that, as James was saying, in a lot of these diseases, but definitely in ovarian cancer, measuring the volume of the disease is absolutely crucial to understand uh, what's going to happen during treatment and, and beyond. And you can only measure the volume of the disease if you have a way of finding the boundary of the lesions. So one of the projects that we're working on at the moment is about creating algorithms that, that can automatically do that segmentation work. It is extremely time consuming if you do it by hand. It is hours of a radiologist's day to do this. So having this functionality is really a, a game changer. And then finally, we have the third class of AI algorithms that we're going to integrate as well, which do the actual data integration. So this would be more towards decision making. They can take all of the different data types as input and then generate different predictions about the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, for example, that James was talking about, or the long-term uh, progression. And I think the three of them are equally important. And what we're trying to do is really to have this integrated, again, way of dealing with everything from the moment you bring all the data in to the final decision making point in a way that is smooth and that makes all of these steps as simple as possible. It's so exciting, it's really joining all the dots together and, and giving the holistic picture. It's a really exciting prospect. Ben, can I ask you, will it be used just in Cambridge or can it be used across the UK or even perhaps globally? Absolutely, we, we want it to be used as widely as possible. As we discussed, there is a plan around looking at different cancers after ovarian and then eventually different diseases. 
you know, our first objective is, of course, to allow visibility within the Cambridge uh, system, visibility to those key data sets so that decisions and research can be made more efficient. But absolutely, when it comes to referring and treating physicians who may not be in the Cambridge ecosystem, but outside, say, in West Suffolk, where patients are being referred to from, absolutely want to create the visibility there so that there is effectively real-time access and visibility to the same patients where those patients are being referred and then supported by clinicians in, in, in Cambridge. So if we can go in that sort of two-step approach within Cambridge and then the referring environment outside of, of Cambridge and effectively reduce to practice this capability, then we think we'll take that and try to template into different cancer alliances. Of course, in, in Cambridge and Suffolk, there's a, a cancer alliance that can maybe replicate into other cancer alliances. And so uh, this is why it's such a great combination working together, leveraging each other's strengths, I think, to support improvement in patient care. But of course, there are differences in the models of care outside of the UK. But in general, there is this sort of hub and spoke type arrangement between referring and, and centralized secondary and tertiary centers that is as important outside of the UK uh, as it is inside. So if we show that we can do that hub and spoke type arrangement in the UK, then it will set us in good stead, I think, to show that we can do it um, outside of the UK too. That's great. And this, how do you think this will impact patient care? I think it will improve patient care in, in many fronts. I think we, we really hope that this will be a tool used in the MDTs, tumor boards, will be a tool used in the clinic. So it will lead to better assessment of treatment response, better trials to trials, better allocation to clinical trials, and thus better outcome. But also it will put the patient in the center, basically. And, and what we hope to produce is also that patients can look at their data and be part of decision-making because the data will be, they will be a snapshot of their data. They'll be participating on their care more than have it so far. So it's not an application just for clinicians, but for the patient as well to see their journey. This is what we hope, obviously, it will be a stepwise, but this is what we hope. Ben, can I ask you, how will you measure success? Obviously, we're just at the start of the journey now, but thinking about the end, how will you measure the success of the application? Well, in simple terms, that the application is used, that ultimately outcomes can be improved, but frankly, in the short term, that decision-making can be improved, that communication can be improved, that wait times could be improved, that time to diagnosis, time to treatments can be improved as, as well. But I think collaboration between referring and treating groups, also the quality of care that can be provided, freeing some time up potentially to devote to the patient rather than finding documents or finding information. You know, if we can improve that whole process, it could be hugely game-changing. I was reading and, and heard last week that for every hour spent in a multidisciplinary team meeting, there are at least two being spent pulling together data that are required for the decision-making to take place. You know, that administrative burden, that time-consuming effort to just simply pull pieces of information together, if we can relieve that burden, then you unleash the clinical expertise to work on clinical problems rather than on administrative problems. So I think there is some real quick wins. And of course, the evidence of those wins will come through adoption. And if the clinicians feel that it's adding value, that it's really helping in the delivery of enhanced care, then of course, that is a true indicator of, of success. But downstream, of course, come all of those quantitative as well as qualitative markers of success that we're, we're really looking for. We are going to do some outcomes-based analysis, and I think this is what's, again, unique about the collaboration. We're going to look at, if you like, the before and after or the impact of this kind of solution on the pathway as we move through this program. So I think we're well set to be able to demonstrate those improvements. Thanks. And James, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I mean, I think just to underscore a lot of what everyone's been saying today. I mean, I think there are huge opportunities for patients around this effort. We're going to improve the quality of the decision-making we do simply because we can make sure we don't miss important data. I think it's gonna be more efficient. I think it's gonna save NHS time. 
I think it's going to enable different things. It's going to enable very important opportunities to learn more about the complexities of an interaction between a patient, their genome, their tumor microenvironment, and a medicine. And I think that will lead to more trials and more important uh, interventions for patients. And lastly, and this is really important, I think by bringing together machine learning methods and data integration, we can start to bring up the quality of care for many cancers across the country. And just to highlight using ovarian just as an example, because it's relatively infrequent, you know, we don't have specialized radiologists in every hospital around the country. We don't have specialized pathologists. So these approaches have the opportunity to offer much more scalable solutions for rare diseases or rare, rare diseases and really change outcomes. There are some challenges, as uh, I think your question alludes to. So, you know, this is major change, major ambitious research. I think the key to that is teams and we have the huge amazing resource that is the people in Cambridge and our collaborators in GE. And I think a lot of that is, is so critical. And then I think in, in terms of our wider hospital environment, there's enthusiasm to see dramatic change occur. And that's change management is a really <laughs> interesting thing. As Ben has alluded to, we're going to look at whether this actually speeds things up. I think those positives feedback into the adoption and perhaps help persuade people who might be less enthusiastic that this is going in the right direction. Success is always good. Yeah, it's great to have something tangible to show people. Ben, can I ask you, what are the challenges and opportunities in undertaking collaborations with researchers? Now, please be honest. <laughs> well, in all honesty, I think that the challenges have been fewer. I mean, certainly in terms of undertaking the collaboration and the opportunities, I think, of have grown. But of course, there are challenges in terms of when industry, which has more commercially focused objectives and clinical teams who have much more patient or clinical and research focused objectives. But honestly, I think if you like, if you if you put those pieces together the, and, and draw a Venn diagram, what's at the center there is we both have the patient's interest, I think, at the heart. And we both know that actually when you look at timelines and you look at all of those things that need to get done in a project like this, actually, we're all working really to enhance um, patients' outcomes. So actually, that's where, although there may be challenges, because we have different cultures, different approaches, I guess, the opportunity that emerges from that is actually really very closely aligned. And I think in terms of the uh, improvements in outcomes, particularly for the patient in terms of clinical and also experience and, and satisfaction outcomes, we have this all, enormous opportunity to improve health economic outcomes and of course the experience of um, clinicians who have so much to do, the cognitive burden as well as the actual workload burden is ever increasing. Those opportunities are common to, to us both in terms of supporting improvement. So, so I think for me, where we have those differences, if you like, that lead to challenge, we've actually sought to learn from each other and put those learnings into practice and have, because we have this sort of richness and diversity of, of background and thinking, actually come up with a much stronger, more viable program. And that's what's exciting. We would never, ever have been able to do this without the, you know, the expertise and the drive, clinical particular of the team at Cambridge and the innovation that comes as a result I think of overcoming those challenges so that's what's special. Thanks Ben it's good to hear uh, just for balance I'm going to throw an opposite question to Evis just to say what are the challenges and opportunity in undertaking collaborations with industry partners Evis? Actually I don't think there are many challenges uh, I mean I think the opportunities were great as we have shown I think uh, things have moved pretty fast I'm not generalizing this for any industry uh, one sort of creates the, the links and the opportunities, and then obviously it needs to be a, a mutual sort of interest and, mm. uh, and chemistry to take these things forward. So uh, I think this is just the beginning. I think the opportunities are endless because we don't really want to keep this, obviously Cambridge Central only. We've always said we want to take it to East Anglia, we want to take it to all England, but actually why not to the rest of Europe and, and, and beyond mm. the US? Because it just, once you create something like this, I think it would be a pity to remain geographically confined. 
Can I ask my researchers on the call where you see integrated cancer medicine taking us in the next five to 10 years? But uh, Maria, can I throw that one out to you? I can give it a try. I can see it taking us to an exciting future where I think what I would like to see is two things happening in parallel. So on the one hand, on I guess on the patient side of things, I would like that integrated cancer medicine is not a concept, is not an institute, is not a project. It's the way we do medicine in Addenbrooke's in Cambridge and in every other institution that embraces this idea. So every single patient that comes in knows that all of their data are going to be treated in a unified manner, processed, viewed longitudinally, hopefully also with a viewer, like Evis was saying, such that you know the patients that want to see it, that want to be uh, engaged in the process, have that chance and can feel really empowered about the treatment. So I, I would really love for, for this to be really standard of care. And I think we're going in that direction and I think that we will see it. And the other thing that I am very excited about which we haven't really mentioned, but that is kind of, I think, implicit in everything we're saying, is the opportunities for research. One of the biggest bottlenecks right now for research, but particularly for the research that deals with integrated data sets, is actually putting those data sets together. And what this tool is also going to give us is the opportunity to, in a really systematic manner, create those integrated data sets where we know exactly everything you know all of the data that has been taken at every time point during the course of of treatment and, and follow-up for for a cancer patient and what that will give us for research is just invaluable i mean we will be so much more productive uh, when we're developing the new decision support systems but also our, our biological understanding we're so interested in understanding the different scales of the disease what happens on a macroscopic imaging level compared to what's happening on a you know, microscopic pathology level, these data sets will give us that information and we will be able to access it in a way that is natural, that is basically designed for these, for these analyses to happen. And I am very excited about it. And I know that we will get there in, yeah, as you say, five years time. Yeah, I think, I think we will see that. Beautifully explained. Jane Devis, anything to add? She said it all. <laughs> so my last question then, Ben, is how will industry and particularly GE Healthcare play a part in that exciting journey that Maria has just outlined for us? Oh gosh, look, I think we, we're humble enough to realise that actually our role is to enable the delivery of care, which people like Maria and James and, and Evis are at the, at the sharp end in, in doing. So, you know, what we want to do is to shift, if you like, from being a technology provider to be a partner in advancing care. And I think if, if we can support the advancement of care and the improvement in outcomes, of course, through the technology that we provide, but also through the services or software or solutions that we, you know, especially in this case, but more increasingly so, we're co-developing, actually that, that is where we want to be. So, so for me, how will not just GE Healthcare, but industry play a part? I think we've got to be partners in the advancement of, of care. And, and I just really want to reinforce, it's been an absolute pleasure and a real privilege to work with the Cambridge team because as we play a small part in that, patients will, will benefit and, and hopefully the team more broadly at Cambridge and beyond will, will benefit too. So it's, it's a wonderful journey to be on, I think. And uh, let's get to our first uh, installation quickly and start delivering on those uh, on the promise that we're talking about here it's fantastic well it just remains to me to say thank you very very much to all four of you for joining me today for this podcast it's been a brilliant conversation a really exciting prospect and i can't wait to see how the project develops thank you If you want to find out more about the work of the Mark Foundation Institute for Integrated Cancer Medicine, please visit our website at www.integratedcancermedicine.org, where you can find details of the ICM vision, all the current research, clinical trials, resources, publications and team information. You can keep up to date with our latest news and events and you can also sign up for our newsletter. If you would like more information about the work of the CRUK Cambridge Centre, please go to www.cirukcambridgecentre.org.uk or you can connect with us on Twitter using our handle at CRUKCAMCENTRE. 
Thanks for listening and do join us again soon.